Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Portuguese American Art Gallery Meet the Artist session. On behalf of the Embassy of Portugal in Washington, D.C., Palcas, the Chamber of Commerce, and FLAD. My name is Sandra Pires, and I'm the cultural attaché at the Embassy of Portugal in Washington, D.C. We are here today to meet the artist Patricia Silva. So this session is going to be streamed on Facebook as well as on Zoom. Please put your questions on the chat box. We also have here with us Cristina da Silva, who will be co-hosting this session with me. Cristina, would you like to introduce yourself and the artist we are going to meet today, Patricia Silva? Yes, thank you, thank you. It's very nice to be here, Sandra. My name is Cristina da Silva. I am a board member of Palcus, uh, born and raised in Westchester, New York, um, where I still live and practice law. And it is my honor this evening to introduce our artist, Patricia Silva. Patricia is a Lisbon-born visual artist based in New York City, working with photography, video, and words. They earned a bachelor's in fine arts and photography from the School of Visual Arts and an MFA in advanced photographic studies from Bard College. Patricia has participated in Portuguese bicultural art panels at the Victoria University at Toronto, University of California at Berkeley, and the University of Macau in China. In 2011, Patricia curated the first Luso-Brazilian pop-up arts festival in New York City. In 2016, one of their self-published projects earned them an invitation to the White House by the Obama administration. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you for being with us this evening. Patricia, I will jump already to a little question. So I would like to ask you, um, so you are Luso-American, right? And the, you, I would like to know how is your, 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 your personal story connected to your art or related to? Yeah, so um, I, so first of all, thank you for welcome, welcoming me tonight. Um, thank you for doing this. And I also want to say thank you to what made this event possible. So thank you, Palkas. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, uh, Portugal U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And thank you also to the whole team at the embassy, because I know that um, you are here, Sandra, but I know there's always teams of people of invis invisibilized labor that make these things possible. So I want to thank the the entire team behind this. And I know that, Grazie, you are behind the scenes. So thank you for being here and making this smooth like olive oil tonight. So thank you for inviting me and for making this possible. Um, to answer your question, yes, I actually, I do consider myself Portuguese American, even though like that term, I, I feel like it's often used for people who are born in the US of Portuguese heritage, and that's fine, like love that, but I've lived in the US for most of my life. So I also call myself Portuguese American because I feel like both cultures have influenced me um, entirely and sometimes in equal measure, sometimes not. But um, but that's, I, I definitely consider myself that even though I think from what I understand, it's a little bit unusual because that term is not reserved for people who are born in Portugal, but I was, and I still, and I consider myself Portuguese American. I hope I've answered the question. Yeah, um, and, but how is your personal story mm. related to your art? Yeah, so in regards to that, so I make artwork um, one of the um, Pre most, I guess, long lasting and present component of my art making is thinking about emigration, immigration, like in a long term basis. So, for example, um, thinking about the narratives of immigration that are very present in Portugal and very present in the US, but thinking about them um, outside of these narrative structures that I'm really used to and I think we are really used to, which is the narrative of you know, the great, um, you immigrate, so you are in one zip code, you leave, you go to another, and then you either come back, and that's and that validates the act of immigration, or you don't come back, and you are absolved into this other thing, and that validates the act of immigration. And for me, I really resist those two things. I think about immigrating as, um, I think our lives are actually far more, our experiences are far more complex than that, and I think 
about immigration as more of a long term dynamic that um, challenges a lot of perspectives at the same time. So I operate from that a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw your your pictures at the on the website, the Portuguese American Art Gallery, and um, and the, there was these pictures of the of the the sea, the ocean, mm -hmm. right? And um, so it's it's lots of things can come up. You know, you think when you think about immigration, you think about the the Atlantic. Is that the Atlantic Ocean? Yeah, it is actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, for me, like the Atlantic is a marker of distance. Um, I also think, you know, when we think about, you know, we can also think about Portugal as part of Iberia and part of a, an Iberia that's not just Portugal and Spain, but all, all the other cultures that exist within those two countries. And, you know, Basque people were in the Atlantic way before Columbus, right? So I think when I think about the Atlantic, the history of that, you know, transatlantic um, um, travel um, is even longer than, than than the settlement of this country initially. Um, but for me, it's really there as a marker of distance. Um, yeah, and also to be near where I live, I have access to the Atlantic Ocean. That's great. <laughs> And I don't know if you also want to ask some question, Christina. No, when, when, when Patricia, when you were speaking about the Atlantic as a marker of distance, do you also see it as also a, a connection between the two continents? Was that ever anything that um, inspired you in, in, in that picture? Or in this? Know something, it, um, if it does, it's, um, I also see it as this like body of fluidity that is uncontainable. Oh. So it's this thing that's sort of there, it separates masses of land. Um, I, I know that like the sea has this like really specific mythology in Portuguese culture and all seafaring cultures, right? But, but, also, but, you know, because I'm from Portuguese culture, I'm used to it from there. So, but I don't really attach myself to that too much. Uh, it's just not um, like that aspect of it um i don't think about that much it's sort of like okay here's a marker of distance here's why i have to take an airplane um but here's this other body of water that is literally just too difficult to contain it's i can't swim from one land of a mass you know i can't swim to the other side right um so it's really there as just this sort of um a marker of distance I, I don't know how else to say it but i don't like the whole poetics of the sea thing is not like for me it's it's an acknowledgement of something i have i have to cross over and over but from the air so mm -hmm. if anything i attach myself more to clouds <laughs> than, yes. the and the sea, <laughs> and the sea. but but i want to draw attention to the fact that both of these things are completely fluid they're both around water and they change shape you know, so I, I find that very interesting. Yeah, Absolutely. but even though you were on an airplane, you <laughs> know that you have to cross, you are on an airplane because you have to cross that immense uh, ocean. Yeah, and you see, you know, you see the, the, the ocean like on the little airplane yeah. trajectory. It's just all blue, all blue beneath you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and uh, Patricia, um, you said you, you you moved here. How old were you when you came from Portugal? And um, yeah. and, and, and how did that influence your art or your your co continual connection to Portugal or visiting? How did that sort of um, play into your art? Yeah. So I moved here as sort of like an early teenager, like like teen teenage time. And I um you know, it was difficult. It was difficult because I missed my friends. I missed my grandparents. I missed my entire family. So here I had my mom, my dad, great. My brother, super great. But then everybody else was far away, right? So, um, so what, like going back and forth, going from, you know, then Philadelphia, you know, and then Massachusetts and then New York, but going back and forth, 
is something that I did growing up and that's how I maintained connections with family. And so every vacation was seeing family. There was like no trips to Hawaii, you know, like, <laughs> it was just, oh, okay. My parents had the two weeks off of work and, and we go see family and just maintain things. And, and I really loved that. Um, I liked that a lot. And in terms of how that info, you know, conversely, just being in New York and being around image culture, suddenly I'm like, whoa, this is an ex like image culture in the US, and especially when I moved here, was very explosive compared to um, Portugal at the time, right? Okay. So that was um, something that made an impact on me. So moving here was the start the impact of the image culture that you saw, the differences between Portugal and New York or the U.S. and the Northeast. Absolutely. And I grew up in a house, like, we didn't have a camera. Like, I think we didn't have that. All the photographs we had, they were, like, very, like, uptight school photos. Or, like, we have to go to the photographer. Like, we would go to, like, we would go to a photo studio and have our portraits taken or, like, weddings, baptisms, family gatherings. But we didn't have, like, a camera that was there to kind of that I would play with, you know what I mean? I was mostly running around outside, like being a kid, you know, climbing trees and being very active. Um, yeah, so I think I, I sort of took, I can't say that I took the visual world for granted. I didn't, now I know that I didn't, but at the yeah. time I wasn't really thinking about it. I was just in it. And mm. when like, moving to the US was like, oh, image world, it's a thing. It's, a, it's an active thing. It's a cultural thing. Yeah. I didn't think about that before. Patricia, okay. was there a moment where you, you thought uh, that you, a turning point in your life that you said, I'm going to, to, to be a photographer? Mm. Yeah, I, I decided to choose that field because I thought, oh, I, I want to study communications. And for me, photography was a specialization within communications as a field. That's how I conceived of it. Because when I was looking at communications, you know, courses and stuff, everything was uh, things I wasn't interested in. Um, like e-com this, e-com that. And I was like, oh my God, really? You know, but looking, studying about, studying printing, was very interesting to me, which I did. I learned photography in a dark room, a traditional black and white dark room, and then color. Um, that was very interesting to me. And I then started working in photo editing pretty early. And I loved that because it made me feel connected to things um, bigger than me and, and more far away than where I was. I felt like it was um, a way of getting to know the world. Yeah. So I just want to remind the people that are watching us that you can ask questions, either if you are on Zoom or if you are on Facebook, you can ask questions in the chat box on, uh, on Zoom and on Facebook, you can leave a message and we, um, Patricia can answer the answer here. So you are free to, to ask your questions too. So, yeah. And um, P Patricia, may I ask you a Maybe a weird question. Why do you photograph? What do you, what do you want to, what, why, do, why do you photograph? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get the simple answer. Well, it's easy to say, but I think there's more there, which is curiosity. Like I love to um, think about narratives through image. So even though I photograph and I make pictures very deliberately, very slowly, but very deliberately, I also work with other images that I don't make and don't take and I kind of assemble them or uh, actually in one of the photographs that are in the tent that are in the show right now, uh, one of them is just a family photo, you know. Um, so I photograph because I like to think about narrative. I like to offer something that I've experimented with um, and hopefully that when I say offer, I mean, I hope that I make conversations possible in a way that um, certainly lots of conversations around these topics happen without me and will continue to happen without me. But one wants to offer a contribution and that's how I choose to try. <laughs> of course, and you you are doing great actually. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, uh, so when we, we did the preparation for this session, you said that you you 
you don't take many pictures, right? You don't take many pictures because we were talking about the, like this image world where we live that, you know, it's full of images and everything. And you were saying that you don't take uh, as many pictures as, as, I don't know, as someone can imagine. Mm -hmm. But um, can you explain the, the process that you, the, the process of doing your, your work? How, how, do, how does that work? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, maybe, um, I, whatever pictures I take, I think 10% is what I actually end up choosing. It's a, a really like low percentage of success rate, you know, in, in that regard. And um, it's just how I think, like taking pictures for me, it's not something that I, it's not a big act. It's just how I live. Like I probably took three pictures today and I, I will never look at them again. You know, she's like, oh, okay, that happened. Oh, okay, oh, okay. You know, and, and then that's that. But then there are some photos that I think, oh, okay, this has potential. Oh, there's potential for me to integrate this into something. Or very often this happens to me. I have to come back and reshoot this. Or I think, oh, I wonder what, I wonder what was published in this date about this, this topic. And I wonder if that's relevant to what I'm thinking about. Um, so when I say, um, I, yeah, I, it, it's about like a 10%, 10, maybe 15 maybe, rate of like what I choose versus what I actually take. Um, but I'm okay with that. I, yeah, I'm okay with that. That's good. That's interesting. You know, I would imagine that a photographer takes so many pictures to, to be able to choose one, but it's also interesting that, you know, you see the potential in, because you have a trained eye, so you see the mm -hmm. potential in uh, in the pictures that in the in not so many pictures that you you take yeah and um i don't know christine if you want no yeah i was just thinking i know that you work in photography and in video and i guess i just wanted to know do you have a preference between mm -hmm. one of the two mediums is there something that you enjoy mm -hmm. more than the other in, in your storytelling in uh expressing yourself yeah, I love it that you said storytelling. I um, I prefer um, photo and video for, for different circumstances or for different okay. um, project, projects, not really projects, but for different experiences. So for example, if I want to really emphasize something um, or a sequence of things, I, I, I choose photography for that. And Photography is really great to sort of make people think about sequencing more so than film for film and, and for video. It's like you can't take it for granted. It has to be very experimental to sort of make its mark in a way um, because we live in real time, you know, um. Um, but with photography, it's really it. There's a lot of power there to make people think about how we make sense of the visual world because it's it's still. Um, but if I want something that's more ex based on an experience and on a feeling and on um, a particular um, I don't know, disruption of something, then I, I do choose video. That's just how I've worked so far. Maybe that will change. But So they seem to be pretty equal, depending on, on what the, the point that you're trying to get across um, or the message or the story. Uh, you use one medium or the other. Now you had mentioned before about um, editing. Does that, could you explain that? Do you mean, in other words, editing your own photographs or do you work with other photographs, other artists' photographs? And uh, I don't know if the word manipulate is correct or edit or change or make them your own. Is that something that um, yeah. you do? So, yeah, I mean, I don't really manip manipulate my photographs at all. I'm very mm -hmm. like, Press the button and yeah. go. Um, that, that's it. You know, I sort of do that. Uh, which, you know, if you think about it, there's also there's a lot that has to happen behind the scenes to make that For button sure. do the job, right? Or not do the job, but do uh, capture everything all at once. Um, but in terms of, so I don't personally do any manipulation of my photographs. I don't think you know, maybe. I did collage a long time ago, but you know, uh -huh. it's a little bit different. When I talk about editing and working in editing is I, I've worked for magazines and, and companies just like working with other people's photographs, not my own and just making books, making slideshows. Um, yeah, doing all kinds of like work around that. That's interesting. Okay. And um, Patricia, you also mentioned the, the uh, when we did the preparation session, that you you have different cameras you use different mediums 
yeah. for your for your pictures, uh, yeah. right? Do you have a prefer uh, like one that you prefer? You know, I don't know. A famous photographer said this, and I, I know if I'm forgetting who, but someone said uh, that the best camera is the one you have with you. And uh, that's, not, that's true. Well, I guess that works. Yeah, it's the best. I, to this day, I think is the best answer to that question. Um, that is a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the the ten the ten photos that I have in the show right now they were they all have very different like sources of capture. So for example, one I've already said one is a family photo, right? Mm -hmm. One was taken with you know a very like fancy you know DSLR that I keep that I use when I'm teaching you know video stuff. Um, one was there are, um, I think two that are taken with my mobile phone. One was taken with I think a like a four by five, which I think people now call that um, large format, but I consider it medium format. So, um, and then there's one that actually, there's a couple that are made with pinholes and um, yeah. So they're all like from very different sources. Um, yeah. And actually I have one of the, can I show you the pinhole that I made? Oh, please, yeah. please do. I think that's cool. So you, I don't know how this is gonna go. Like, I think you can read it. Yeah, I think the lighting is, yeah 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 we can see it yes we can see uh, it well, do you want to tell us what it is or do you want us to tell everyone what that is yeah well this is actually a what is it a five liter no a one gallon i don't know how many it's like a three liter i think this just feels like a three liter like olive oil can <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that i made into a pinhole so actually here's like the aperture it's really in there and you know like the film this is made for four by five film i mostly like shoot um, I still shoot film actually, and then I have it scanned and then I work with it. Um, but the four by five goes in here, the four by five holder goes in here. That's so yeah, it's, it's not, the that most, is so wild. That it's is not so the wild. most high tech thing, but it, um, yeah, I, I like how in my work, this kind of camera coexists with like a digital camera from 15 years ago and a DSLR that looks pretty great. Um, so I like how these things all coexist and I, but I don't like drawing a, a too much attention to that. Um, but I do like working in that way. So we have a question from the audience. Hmm. So uh, we have a question from Leonor Brazão and she's asking, your photography named The Wrong Island seems to be the stage of a movie or story. Can you comment? Yeah, so you know what it is? It's actually about a play. Maybe I shouldn't say where it is because like, I consider it the wrong island because it has too many cars and it's a place where I've lived. And, um, but it's just, it has too many cars and it's really hard to get around. And for me, that's just wrong. You should be able to walk places. <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> sidewalks and be able to like take a bus to the beach instead of having to like have this whole ordeal about traffic and cars. You know, so that's that's what it's about. It's about feeling. It's really about feeling trapped. Mm. Mm, okay, so we've done this question. I was seeing if we had another question. Yeah. Um, so um, I would also like to to know. So you have the some of your themes are uh, the immigration, the limits of identities. Mm -hmm and the diasporic renewals and of self to places. Mm -hmm. Would you like to explain a little bit better this uh, yeah. term? Sure, um, I think that, well, I think I already talked about the, the first part um, yeah. of that uh, question. In terms of diasporic renewal, I think that's something that people who are, and I was going to say bicultural, but I'm, I've always had this like hesitancy around that term because I think, like uh, I live in New York, which is my gosh, it is multicultural at every turn. And Portugal, like coming from the Lisbon area, especially Lisbon as a city, I always remember it being very multicultural, like mm -hmm. from when I was a kid, you know, and not just tourists, you know, <laughs> but like just ha having a lot of people from different cultures that have lived there. So I, when you think, when I think about so when I say bicultural, I'm like, yes, I'm bicultural, but each point um, is ex extreme, like there's a lot to expand on both of them. So when I talk about diasporic renewals, um, and I don't really, that's like the, 
the easiest way that I can say that is how when we are from, when we socialize with multiple cultures, we find ways to think about things in a different way. And I call that renewal. You know, we find ways to think about um, how we relate, how we socialize, what our values are, how they interconnect, how values bring us together, how common values bring us together. And that I think has the, can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can hear you. We, we, we missed you for a second, but we could still hear you, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. So, and that has the potential to um, kind of go beyond what we think about a thing or a place or a person or their culture and just really start to getting to know people in a deeper, deeper way. So that I call renewal. And, and this is why I really resist talking about immigration as this like nostalgia <laughs> or like the great return or, or the great assimilation, because I think it's so much more dy dynamic than that. It's so much more permeable than that. Mm -hmm. And I think it should, I think cultures should be permeable to each other. Now that's not to say that I, I go into like the Bronx and I, I think I own the place. No, of course not. Um, just because cultures are permeable doesn't mean that we um, shouldn't be respectful. In fact, we should be more respectful. And, you know, coming from Portugal where I, you know, was taught to be generous as a kid and as an adult, my family, I think, uh, would call and do and, and practice generosity. But I think when we talk about kind of intercultural relations, we have to really think deeper than generosity. I think we have to talk about or think about how to apply like something a closer to hospitality, which is uh, more renewing um, and more can be more connected than just generosity or or being or just being part of something like a diaspora, right? So um, how can we be hospitable wherever they are, we are? And how can, as we make our cultures permeable, how can we practice hospitality, you know? Um, so I, that's the best way that I can sure. summarize that is with diasporic renewal. I don't know if that's the best word, but um, that's as close as I've gotten so far. That's great. It's it's very understandable, very you know, very clear, actually. And we have another question in the Q and A session. So the question goes: the photography pinhole of the Atlantic looks like a poem. Do you write about your images or themes? Uh, not so much publicly, um, unless I have to. Like if somebody said, "Oh, please write an artist statement about this or that," then I do. But I. Um, I may write for myself just to try to figure something out, um, but I don't like to share too much about what I write about my work, mm -hmm. excuse me, because I never want to sort of influence how people think about it. I never want to imply that my way of thinking about this is the only way, you know, so I always hesitate from sharing that. That's interesting because in fact, I know you don't like the term universal, but uh, I know you don't like it, but the, it's interesting what you say because that's what makes uh, art so universal because you sometimes maybe you mean something by doing uh, a photography and then somebody else coming from a different culture or from a different uh, uh, part can, can look at it in a different way. Or in a different yeah. time in their life can interpret it differently and love it equally but the meaning may be different. And that's the beauty of what you do and, and art in general. Absolutely. And I think that's yeah. why art is so powerful. And about the word universal, I just find, I'm just intimidated by it. Like I'm not against it. I'm, I just feel very intimidated by it. And uh, like, especially with the themes that I work with, I I think that our, human, our humanity is universal without a doubt. Like we are one human family. This is unquestionable to me. But I think just because uh, because we share that humanity doesn't mean that the systems that govern the world respect that equally. So I think sometimes okay. art and images, uh, a, 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 not absorb, but images have a lot of pressure kind of projected onto them to sort of be universal. And I think we should really think about this is my personal opinion I, and, and method. I, I always think about well, how can we really think about um, like the, the historical conditions 
of this place, of this culture, of this geography, of this person's experience, right? And I think when that, then we're talking about things that will lead us to the universal, universal. but I, I think the photo is just a method of getting there. I think that um, the image is a starting point, not an ending point for the universal. That, that's how I feel about it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. We have another question, Patricia. So Angela Costa Simões asks, what have been some of your favorite subjects to photograph? Yeah, so I I don't know why, but I really love landscapes, which is um, because I like walking around. I love walking around with a little camera, you know, not necessarily like, you know, when I take that pinhole, I need a tripod. So I need to like prepare for that. That's preparation, right? But most of the time I have like little cameras with me, like portable cameras with me. And I think um, walking around and taking photographs of landscapes is my favorite thing to do. And, and you think a lot and you learn a lot. I think when you're walking around and, and you're looking at things and, and feeling things, I might talk to somebody, I might not. But you're sort of gathering information that informs how mm -hmm. you make and how you compose and how you talk about a place. Um, and all of that, it's sort of, you know, invisibilized labor of making, but it's there. And I think it's why I love being out in the world is because all of those things inform. Um, like, although technically I could be a good studio photographer, but I wouldn't last very long. I would be like, oh, my God, I, I need to go outside right now. <laughs> <laughs> when you say landscapes, do you mean um, like nature landscapes? Or are you just referring to general landscapes? Like it could be the skyline, it could be mountains, it could be. What do you mean by landscapes? Um, like anything that I can do walking around. So like street photography, which okay. I mean, street photography, people think all kinds of like reportage looking things. Um, but I, I anything that I can do walking around and just mm -hmm. snapping like I right. I can do and I absolutely love um like like oh my god in Portugal I mean every picture you take you know you can apply like a Cezanne filter on your phone mm -hmm. and it's like immediately um it immediately makes this imposed link to some kind of art historical path of what mm -hmm. beauty is um which I find kind of I don't like the shorthand of it all, but I like how it forces people to think about like, oh, this is beautiful. Maybe this is not France, but this is beautiful. You know, just finding beauty in in things that we're not accustomed to thinking are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And you are you also like the um, abstract photography, right, Patricia? Oh, I like all kinds of photography. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I like, like, I don't really do abstract photography, but I like looking at it. I like learning from it. Um, yeah. Do you incorporate some of the abstract in your, in your own, uh, in your own photography or, or no? I don't, I don't see it that way. Okay. I don't, I don't think so. I think I'm very direct. <laughs> like, um, I think I'm very like, here you go. You know, I, I don't um, think about it. And it's not that I think it's wrong. It's just, um, it, it doesn't seem to serve the narrative. I tend to work with very concrete things. Like mm -hmm. when I talk about diasporic renewal, those are very concrete things that involves geography, that involves history, that involves a lot. And for me to be abstract about that, I don't see how it would serve what I want to communicate with a narrative, with a sequence, with that mode of working. Um, but I'm not against it at all. And I, in fact, love looking at it. Love it. Like it. Nice. So we have a, um, a question from an anonymous attendee. And the question goes like this. Most of your photographies translate movement. Do you think this tendency reflects the changes of landscape in your life? Oh, um, I think that's a really good question. I think it's something that I think it's so embedded in my brain that I don't even know how to answer consciously. Um, but I, I, I know that other people have said that about my work. Oh, things are kind of moving. And I really love it that people pick up on that. So thank you for picking up on that. And I do think that I, I do resist, <laughs> even though I make still photographs, I, I do like to point out that things are in movement all the time. Like we're sort of 
even when we are resting, we are moving, you know, not, maybe not be moving, but our body is moving in a different way. Like our brains, you know, we are stimulated um, in micro movements. They're not the macro movement of a jump or going up the stairs. Um, but that's something that I know is very present in how I want my narratives to feel. And I actually want to just share, I don't know why this is coming up, but I'm just going to share that this actually came from a teacher of mine that I had in like grade five or six in Portugal, where we were like in the classroom, you're a very like strict teacher and you have to behave and sit up straight and all these things. Uh, and this teacher yeah. <laughs> who was like you very- You made me want to straight, just the idea of it. <laughs> you know, school. But <laughs> this teacher said something, and I think it was the science teacher who was very approachable and said, oh, we were talking about glass. And, we, and, and the person, the teacher said that glass is actually not a solid. So when you look at glass, it's still like slowly, ever so slowly dipping down. And maybe glass is not made like that anymore. But I remember like the whole class like went and turned to the windows. And of course we could, we never noticed it before, but then we saw this glass and how it was sort of more like glass was kind of pooled at the bottom. And I was like, wow, like things are always in movement. Everything that you look at with your eyes, everything is kind of moving, but it doesn't look that way. And I, mean, I was young when I heard that, but I think that has struck with me. And I think the way that I make my images, I think it, it comes from there. It has to come from there. And photography, you know, has a lot of glass. The history of photography is very dependent on paper, but more glass than paper. Very interesting. And optics are glass. You know, the whole history of um, the, I never know how to say it, but uh, the first book of optics, you know, it's entirely around glass. So, yeah, interesting. Fluid, everything is fluid. fluid yeah. is dynamic. Yeah. 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 yeah so I, I, I feel like, in a way, I feel like I'm acknowledging the obvious, but we still talk about things in very constricting ways. So, true. I wanted to ask you a question that is not very well related to what we were just talking about. But you know, since we are living in this uh, in this uh, situation right now, how did this whole pandemic affected your your work? Did it affect it, or you produced yeah. as much as you used to? Or? No, I've been largely unproductive. I've been photographing even less, <laughs> but um, but I've been reading more and writing a lot. Um, I so this affected me. It's a little bit too soon to tell because you know we're still kind of going through it. We're near the end finally, um, but I'm still not quite sure how it has affected my work. I know that it has brought um, a different type of attention to my work. Um, but I, I actually, you know, teaching things that I had lined up that were outside of the US were canceled. So that was um, unpleasant because I was like, no, I really wanted to go there. And, you know, my trip, I had a, I, want, I was planning on going to visit Portugal. And last year, I, that did not happen. Um, but then I also actually got COVID very early on. I didn't even know that I had it. Like, I didn't know until a few months later when I was tested and I found out, oh, that thing that felt like the flu. Uh, wasn't the flu. Wasn't the flu. And I'm really lucky. I, I feel really lucky. I knew three people who had it at the same time as me. Uh, one of them is a dear friend. Um, she still has health complications. And the other person who was somebody we both knew, who wrote a lot, who published a lot, somebody who influenced me a lot, uh, whose writings, um, that person passed away. So I, I feel very oh, fortunate. Oh, oh. I feel very fortunate. Wow, how horrible. So it affected your, your, your health also. I was asking, you know, the, if it affected your work, but it affected you because you, you got it as well. Yeah, yeah. But I feel very fortunate. So maybe of course. maybe um, a new sense of gratitude will be seen in my work in the future, but it's, it feels a little too soon to tell. Yeah. You were just saying, Patricia, that you did a lot of writing this past year. I so I was I was wondering if um let's see if i can pose this question properly mm -hmm. is your photography do you base it on your writing mm -hmm. or does your writing come as a result of what you see through your lens 
actually, I think the writing helps me figure out how, not how to photograph, but how do I want to frame things in a way. Mm. Um, and actually, this whole time that I was writing a lot, I, I actually have a, like, I, uh, in June, I was supposed to be in London presenting at a conference a, a, about my photographs, about these photographs that I made. So I'm not going to London, obviously, but I've had to write and present for it. So I've been writing with a specific goal, which is explain this project, explain this process, um, talk about why you do what you do and blah, 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 and be clear and, you know. Um, but normally, not normally, but when I'm writing just to figure things out, uh, I'm literally doing just that. I'm thinking, well, how do I experiment? Like, how can I experiment with this? Is this saying something that I want to say? If I, like, what am I perpetuating if I photograph this this way? And for me, writing and research goes hand in hand. Um, and then from there, I think about how do I, how do I respond? Now I have all this stimulus. Now I've read all this stuff and now I, and I care, right? Uh -huh. So then how do I respond? And then how do I respond from the place that is me, like from the place of my body, how I move through the world, right? And, 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 and what I inherit, right? So when I talk about Portuguese heritage, sometimes I think I consider that an inheritance, <laughs> you know, like it's not like, you know, somebody gave me the crown of Portugal and I have the keys to the country. No, it, it's not like that. It's more like, wow, this is a cultural inheritance. And I think that that comes with responsibility as well, like in day-to-day -day life, you know. Definitely. Definitely. And um, do you have uh, new projects that are in the back burn or, uh, or in um, yeah. right now or, <laughs> or things are a little quiet because of the, the conference that you were supposed to go and you are not going and uh, some mm -hmm. projects that stayed on in standby because of the, the whole situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely things that are on standby and also um, <laughs> like I, I generally tend to work on like seven long term projects and I just decide to dip in and out of like what what feels right or or um, what I'm doing and, and where does it feel right to be. Um, so in terms of like new projects, <clears throat> I can't say that I have new projects, but I do have new ideas for existing projects. Hmm. Yeah. That's part of the renewal, right? You're yeah. almost like yeah. renewing with new ideas of <laughs> of existing projects. That's a very good observation. Thank you. I, yeah. True. And uh, what do you recommend for new generations that are starting now to to do photography? What you know? What could be a word that you could tell them? Yeah, well, I think for people who are starting photography now, the first thing I would say is beware of the algorithms. Um, that's number one. But also, like, you know, don't um, don't settle for the status quo. You know, think about photography has a very long history of perpetuating many things, some good, some not at all good. So make sure you choose wisely how you apply this camera. You know, we still we still use words like shooting and, and all these like negative connotations around how we use cameras and how we portray the world around us and our experiences. So I would really, um, the first thing is I encourage you to do it, <laughs> be aware of the algorithm, and then really think about how you want to engage with this history in a non-destructive way. Thank you. Those are good words for people that are starting and, you know, from an experience point of view, it's, it's very good. So, Leonor uh, Brazão is, um, is, uh, is just making a comment and saying that you need to create another show in New York with a Portuguese American artist like you did in the past. I would love to, but you know what? I did that once and I'm not saying I wouldn't do it again, but I just feel like, like for me, when I did that, that show, I was like, oh my God, you know, <clears throat> I, I really wanted to like be very, like really honor what like Portuguese heritage is. And, you know, I'm from the mainland, I'm from outside of Lisbon, you know, district of Lisbon, but not, not the urban area. So I literally had, uh, it was a Luso Brazilian show, but again, Brazil is so multicultural. Like how does one signify that, right? So, you know, I had a Chinese artists do a landscape. I, I, I sort of wanted to really turn that around. So it took me a lot of time and I, I love the show, but it's still like, I, um, 
succeeded because I thought it was great, but it failed, did not include as many people as I, as I, on, on whose doors I knocked and they were like, oh, we need about a year. And I'm like, I don't have a year. We just have the space for this long, you know, <laughs> but the reason why I would love to help organize it, but I think somebody else should curate it. So I really would love for a Brazilian person to curate it for other entry points into um, how we see Portuguese culture get activated. So I would love for someone else to have with a different point of view to actually curate it. I, I would love to help that happen. Um, but I, I did do that show with like no funding. So it's hard. So we have another question from Nelson Ferreira Rego. He's asking if you will, you will go, you are going to be in the area of Providence, Boston soon. No, I, I don't have plans to. Um, no, I, I don't have plans to, but maybe a show should happen there and then I could come. <laughs> and then you can go. <laughs> Hint. <laughs> Easy solution. Let's make something happen. <laughs> Let's make a show. <laughs> so I, don't, I didn't know you also did a curation, a curation work. Yeah. That Not that often. But not that often, but a couple of times. And yeah. I mean, I guess if you if you count like organizing like film screenings, and I've done several of those as well. But you know, things in in their due time and when it's appropriate. I I have this a hard time like being just this one thing. Just oh, be only this, do only this. I like to sort of incorporate multiple things and learn from multiple things. Yeah, if you if you do lots of projects at the same time as well, like you were saying that you 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 manage to do that. That is, you know, it's it's another perspective that you you have. I don't know if you have another question, Christina. I have one last question. I know that you have had your art um, exhibited internationally, uh, different shows, and I was just wondering if there was one particular show or or two that left a mark on you, something that um, just left some sort of a mark on you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now I have to really think. Um, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. Travel. No. No. I, I welcome that. I really do welcome that. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't always travel for the shows that I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that I was in this making talk about making a mark on me. I was in a small uh, movie screening of a short film that I made. It took me about a year and a half to like produce five minutes. I'm very proud of those five minutes. They work really well. And, um, but it was, it screened in New York and it screened in London and somebody there saw it and recommended it to someone in Mongolia. So I actually, oh, wow. there's a place in Mongolia called Friendship Palace and they had a screening of short works and they actually um, wanted me to sort of do a little like live talk over, over web, you know, like on FaceTime or whatever, because they, um, produced this whole show and uh, produced a screening and I was a part of it. And they said, Oh, we, we really would like you to come and talk about your work. And, but we can't, we can only do this over FaceTime. Are you willing? I said, of course, absolutely. Just tell me when and where. And about three days before um, they had no internet connection. I got this message saying, we may not be able to happen. Stay tuned or stay posted. And then within a few hours, you know, with the time difference. So I knew that there was no internet connection and we ended up not doing the talk. And I thought, wow, and this made a very big mark on me because never would I have had this literally cultural conversation with someone at a place called Friendship Palace in Mongolia. And but then to sort of it was a good reminder that even though all this stuff that I take for granted, like Internet connection and, you know, even before the pandemic, we were used to streaming quite a bit. Right. To really have to really break down walls and barriers, we still have to think about basic access things like if we want to really continue to um, be permeable to each other across borders and, and transnationally, then there's so much to consider that I think. Um, yeah, and I was actually really struck by that. Um, yeah, sometimes things that we, we, think we take for granted. Exactly, we take for, take it for granted, yeah. Yeah, and that let me know that those conversations needed to happen there also. Right. So that was, um, you know, th that story, I feel like it says so much. 
you know, about friendship palace, just the name. Yeah, I know. It's, it's lovely. Yeah. And do you have right. plans to go to, to go there, uh, uh, like uh, in the, in the future to do this, no, to this, this talking person, maybe? Yeah, I think it would have to be over Zoom because it's a very long trip, you know, yeah. and mm. I don't think this small community center is going to have the budget to pay for my flight, you know, and I, I oh. certainly, if I was swimming in millions, absolutely, I would be like, let's fix this internet thing right now. <laughs> I got this. I got uh, this. Yeah, like, <laughs> this is what I can do. <laughs> oh, Who do goodness. I talk to? But I, um, I mean, you know, obviously I would just do what I can, but if, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't see that. It would have to be over FaceTime when it happens. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if anyone has uh, any other question. This is the time because we are almost finishing our talk here with Patricia. So if you want to pose any other question, this is the time or else you can always go to the, to, to the Portuguese American Art Gallery and also to Patricia's, to Patricia's um, website as well. And um, so if you, if you want to ask her questions and you didn't have the chance to ask here, you can always go there. Yeah. So I, I wanted to thank you, Patricia, mm -hmm. for, uh, for being here today with us and to share your, your stories, your, uh, your, um, your art with us. You know, it was really very meaningful and very, very good. And uh, I would also like to ask, to thank Christina for co-hosting this event here today. My pleasure. It was lovely getting to know you a little better, Patricia, and learning a little bit about your story and how you portray it and your storytelling. It was very interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And I want to thank you for welcoming me, but also for putting this show together and showing a variety of different <clears throat> viewpoints and entries into the cultures that we share and love. So thank you for that. And thank you, Sandra, uh, for, for all of your work in this series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks to Graci as well. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, Graci times 10. Thank you. <laughs> Graci, thank you for, for sure. making this possible. <laughs> I'm sure she's nodding and smiling. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.